One of the most wonderful assets about the Cal community is its diversity. But along with its diversity, there are important identities that are often coming into conflict with what the Cal spirit is about. It's associated with feelings of guilt, with feelings of alienation. And guilt and alienation are an important part of what we try to address with this wellness course. My name is Rodolfo Mendoza Denton. I'm a psychology professor here at UC Berkeley. I'm your host for today, alongside Dri Cavusi, ASUC senator and fourth year undergraduate. To talk about coping with guilt, we have a distinguished panel of guests. First, David Surratt, Associate Dean of Students at UC Berkeley. Ruben Canedo Sanchez, Research and Mobilization Coordinator for the Centers of Educational Equity and Excellence, also at UC Berkeley. And last but not least, Elizabeth Rodriguez, Project Manager of Student Affairs Communications at UC Berkeley. Welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Let's get right into the topic of guilt and defining that space around guilt, what we are talking about, what the issues are that our students face in real time. Yeah, so what, for students that don't know or haven't heard the term used before, what is survivor guilt and why is that term used? The first thing that, that came to mind was my family. Um, and so I'm, I'm originally from LA, South Central LA, West LA now. Um, and um, I think about them and I think about the fact that I'm still the only person who has graduated from college in my family, mm -hmm. like ever. Um, and my younger sister is the only one who is currently going to college. So nobody else um, has shared in that experience with us. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's the first thing that came to mind. And I think when I think about guilt or surviving that, right, I think about when I go home and the types of conversations that I am allowed to have in mm -hmm. those spaces, the types of conversations that I would like to have in those spaces, but that perhaps they're not ready to hear, mm -hmm. right? Whether that's around mental health, substance abuse, um, gang violence, whatever it is, right? I, I, there's, it's different. I come with a different perspective and there's guilt. There's guilt about that. There's guilt in knowing that I have access to information that will help my children have a better life and that I don't know yet how to translate that back to a family who's still very much in the same place they were when I left to go to college that's years right. ago. Right. Um, and so I think that's where the guilt comes in for me, like, you know, why me, I guess? I don't well, know. For me, the, the, the way that, that, I, that I can answer that question is twofold. Survivor guilt itself, right, um, comes, from, comes from war, comes from veterans. It comes from folks that, that were going off to war, mm -hmm. coming back home, and they were feeling guilty that they had survived, literally, quite literally. They had survived the war, and they were thinking about their captains, their generals, their best friends, or folks that they felt deserved to live more than they did, for mm -hmm. whatever reason. Uh, but then over time, survivor's guilt evolved in the context of higher education, with students that were starting to feel guilty for surviving traumas, experiences, or communities that they were coming from, right? So. Um, the best example that I can give you is myself, right? So for me, coming from, from the community that I come from, um, I remember coming into Berkeley and I remember being told that I didn't have to worry about housing for the summer and that I didn't have to worry about housing for my first year and that my scholarship was gonna pay for housing for all of my four years at Berkeley. I, hadn't, I never had uh, housing security growing up. Mm -hmm. It was something that on an, on an annual basis, it was like, we'll see where we end up type of thing, right? So that was something that made me feel like, whoa, like what does that even look like, right? And how am I gonna support my family to make sure that they have housing security? Another thing is food, right? Food in the context of, I had meal points and I didn't have to worry about feeding myself or feeding my peers or my peers had food in ways that growing up we didn't. So those fundamental basics, yeah. but then at the same time, going into the classroom, feeling that other folks were more deserving of being in that place and you thinking of those folks who were more intelligent than you felt that you were intelligent that should have gotten into Berkeley and for whatever reason they didn't or weren't there. So it's that guilt of surviving and being in a place that you feel that either you don't deserve or that somebody else deserves is more than you. And it, and, and it has implications at a personal level, at emotional level, academic level. Sometimes our students, because of that guilt, will self-select out of performing at their best or maximizing their opportunities, or seeking for even help. 
Yeah, I, I love the, the, the stories that you shared too captured what for me, my understanding of it too is around the idea of we represent marginalized identities that go into spaces in which we are salient. And we are noticeably uh, one of few uh, come into a space, and then then you start questioning, do I belong here? Mm -hmm. um, because I look around the room and there's no one like me. And, it, and then that's something for me that um, I think uh, in my identity coming into the space was more about me being a first generation college student, me being the, the son of uh, an immigrant Korean parent and a black father from the South, neither of which went to college. So for me, it was um, that, that space, that idea of you're, you're coming in with whatever identity mm -hmm. into a space in which you don't see much of yourself and, and that sense of, if I got here, was it by luck? Was it my own doing? Mm -hmm. And that, that questioning of whether you actually belong in that space and that, and that sense of guilt. And even going back to you know, our communities too, just talking about um, conversational parents, right, Liz? So mm -hmm. I, the struggle is that you are fulfilling a mission and oftentimes you are, you're a numerical minority and you represent almost symbolically the success of right. your family and then the guilt of having to feel like the more you succeed, the further you're, away, you're going away from your family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's yeah. that's my sense of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, and there's that space I think that builds, right? It's like mm -hmm. you, they want you to go to college. I know for me, my family was like, "Go to college, it's the best thing. Like, just do it, do it, do it." And so they push me, push me, push me. But then the minute I had that education, it was like, "Oh, you know." She's a little more educated than us, you know. Like, oh, she thinks, you know. There's that that guilt that they. Un, I think subconsciously put on you mm. sometimes, you know, like we want you to make it, but then after you make it, we want you to still stay <laughs> the same you were before you went to school. I don't know. So it's a, it's a, it's yeah. the space just grows and, and you start to feel like where where is my home, mm. right? Um, and, and outside of the family, think about it this way. A, a lot of us that come from communities that don't have a, a college going culture, right? Mm -hmm. As we progress through our education and by seeking help and seeking mentors and being academically and professionally developed, we start to succeed. And outside of the family, your peers, the ones that you grew up with, it's almost like they're going in the opposite trajectory, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Like as, as you're calling back and you're checking in with folks or you just go home and you're having conversations with them, that awkward moment always happens like, hey, what have you been up to? And they're like, nothing. same, the same, like, or nothing. So how widespread is survivor guilt? I mean, we've, uh, we've, we each can think of specific examples of mm -hmm. individuals who are experiencing some of the psychological consequences of, of survivor guilt, but what are the types of students that are at risk for survivor guilt? Um, and, and David, how, how um, what's the prevalence of the, of the phenomenon? Mm. I mean, I think it's very prevalent. Um, you know, beyond our own stories and our own kind of experiences, you can see the, uh, the dynamics of power and marginalized identities in every space of, of a college campus. Um, colleges are, are a microcosm of larger society. So if you think about the way our students experience a college campus, they're going to experience this in the real world. It's the same type of thing. So many of our students are walking into spaces in which they um, are one of few or, uh, or the only a few, and, we're, and beyond even uh, ethnic or racial identity, you could talk about gender identity in certain spaces, you mm -hmm. can talk about um, uh, particular disciplines in which you don't see many of yourselves. I, I, I've talked to women um, on campus who say, you know, when they're going into their classes in the STEM uh, fields, mm -hmm. uh, they know that they are oftentimes in experiences in their work groups or conversations where they are one of few. And th then there's these impositions of expectations or lack of expectation, to be honest mm -hmm. with you, they had to fend with and, and think mm -hmm. about. And that, that can creep into your mind and cause mm -hmm. you to really question, again, am, am I supposed to be here? Or mm -hmm. should I have chosen a route that was stereotypically more for who I am as a person or who mm -hmm. I identify as? Mm -hmm. yeah. and th thank you for, for touching upon that and for sharing your stories. And it sounds to me like survivorship is not necessarily associated with any direct trauma per se. No. Um, could you elaborate on that, Ruben? Yeah, so I, th I, I, lo I, love, the, I love those two questions that you're yeah. asking us because uh, I don't want folks to walk out of this thinking that survivor's guilt is, is an identity specific thing. Mm -hmm. It's an experience, yeah. right? It's an experience that, that, that many folks have de depending on what life experience they had. So for example, you have like, it, it goes beyond racial, uh, beyond gender, beyond socioeconomic class, so on and so forth. You can, you can have somebody who feels guilty because they survived um, any type of circumstance or because they didn't have an experience. I've, I've been in spaces where, where students have the courage to share, hey, I actually don't identify with what you just said 
or actually that was not my experience. This was my experience. And I've heard a student who is undocumented talk about their journey as a Chinese immigrant who grew up in Peru, but graduate, but immigrated through Canada. And people are like mind blown that all of that global uh, moving could have happened. I also know a student who, who kept, kept hearing things about white students and they were like, hey, I'm white, but actually I grew up in a trailer park. So don't assume that just because I'm white, I come from an economic privilege or from an educational privilege, because I don't. Mm. I've also heard of another student who had the courage of saying, yes, I come from wealth, but because I shared with my parents that I'm queer, they completely disconnected themselves from me. So my, my FAFs are my financial aid says that we're wealthy, but I see not a single dollar, yeah. and I'm having to work my way through college. So it's, it's the guilt of either having that privilege or not having it that grounds people. So how prevalent is it is as prevalent as we're being willing to engage in it. Because mm -hmm. guilt is a universal experience. Mm -hmm. That survival comes from any of those touch points. Mm -hmm. So Ruben, um, I, uh, you were very helpful in tracing back the origins of the term survivor guilt back mm -hmm. to experiences of war and really making clear for us that sometimes the experience of the success of coming to Cal can feel almost like surviving something very serious, mm -hmm. something almost as traumatic as war. Uh, you mentioned that there are personal consequences, emotional consequences, academic consequences, and health consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's very helpful in defining that space for us, and also the point about not being a thing that's tied to a particular group, mm -hmm. but an evolving experience mm -hmm. on the college campus. I'd love to talk about some of the psychological mechanisms that are associated with survivor guilt uh, and move into that, that psychological experience, that psychological space, what that's all about. Mm. What can, yeah, what can really be done about the toxic thoughts associated, you know, the why me, why, what you were saying, why was I so lucky, why did I get to go to school? Mm -hmm. Like, what can be done about thoughts like that? Mm, I, I think for me, what, what has always been really helpful is what I, what I call like calling attention to attention, right? And so if I see myself, mm. um, if I see myself going down a trajectory where I'm making a decision out of guilt or out of the fear that is associated with the guilt, right? Mm -hmm. And so a perfect example of, you know, I came here and similar to Ruben, like first time I had housing, first time I had some kind of money coming in, mm -hmm. you know, on my own away from my family. And my family was back at home, you know, couldn't keep the lights on, literally, mm -hmm. you know, didn't know where their next meal was coming from. And so I started using my tuition money to help my mom cover her expenses, right? And what that got me was an eviction notice, right? I, I mean, that I made a decision because I felt guilty about having to help someone else who I love very, very much, but I had my own child at the time, so I was one of few. I was one of three women who came in as a freshman at that point with a child already, mm -hmm. right? And instead of making a decision that is, was in my best interest and in, the, in service of my education and what I was trying to ultimately obtain, I made a decision out of the guilt. And I made one that was not very smart and caused me a lot of mm -hmm. tangible issues, right? I mean, I was able to work through them and whatnot. But if I had thought about it long term and said, someday I'll have my degree and I'll have a steady job and I'll have income and I can decide at that point how I want to help my family, how I want to help, you know, I want to start a scholarship someday, right? And yeah. if I had kept my eye on the prize at that point, I might have made better decisions, right? right? But because I was making them out of the guilt that I felt, Mm. I, I mean, it just wasn't, it wasn't a mm. smart thing to do in, in retrospect, yeah. right? But I, mm. I did, I'm also a believer in you do what you need to do at the time. Mm -hmm. And so at the time, that was the choice that I made. But mm -hmm. um, I, I do think, you know, it, in terms of the impact, right? Like that's a very small example, but yeah. um, that's how it surfaced for me, I think, at that time. Yeah, and I, I appreciate the question about whether psych, the, the psyche, right? The psychological impacts that survival mm -hmm. guilt has. I, I love that question because oftentimes, um, so the centers that, that we work at, we call the CE3. So that these are all non-traditional students, right? So we're talking about first-generation college goers, low-income students, undocumented, transfer students, veterans, foster youth, student parents, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and I can tell you that survivor's guilt is something that, that, that is our, our core mm -hmm. of the work that we're doing in different ways, right? Just getting students to honor the fact that Point blank period, nobody made a mistake in your admission to Cal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about that, let's start there. Because a lot of the students 
they're seniors and they're still looking over their shoulders thinking that somebody's going to say, hey, we made a mistake. Sorry, go home. Yeah. You know, it's, it, that's very real. Yeah. And, and I frequently see students in their graduations come up to me and say, this really happened, huh? And this is their graduation. Mm-hmm. Like they're, they're in cap and gown. They just got that diploma. They come with their families. They give me a hug and they say, like, this is real. This is really happening right now. That, that's just to invite you to, to, to what's going on in their internal worlds, that you can go here four or five years or two, three years of your transfer student, and is it, and isn't until your graduation day, your day of the ceremony, when you're with your family, you're in a cap and gown, you get your diploma, that that's when it hits you that this actually really happened. So that invites you to the psychological implications of survivor's guilt. That's something that is very withheld in the inner world of our students where we have to ask them to invite us in there to see how guilt is impacting them. Mm. So I think one of the important points that this raises is that the psychological experience of guilt, because it's such an inner Mm -hmm. personal phenomenon, we often don't realize that other students might be feeling Mm -hmm. exactly the way that we're feeling. Mm -hmm. And it leads to that feeling of uh, perhaps loneliness, a feeling like I'm the only one here, I'm the only one that's that's the mistake. Along those lines, what are some of the other psychological, we talk about, of course, survivor guilt, uh, but what are some of the other uh, syndromes or, or, you know, psychological phenomena that you see associated with these kinds of experiences? Mm. Uh, well, I, I appreciate Ruben's uh, kind of comments too, because you know I, I finished my doctorate a year ago, and mm-hmm. only just recently have I uh, presented information on my, on my research. And to this day, I still feel uh, like questioning my own uh, skills or mm-hmm. that sense of being an imposter as an academic or as a scholar. Uh, when you walk into situations, and it's taken me. I, I was I was a speaker at my commencement. I wore the robe. I, I talked about my identity in my speech to my classmates, and still to this day. Um, there's that little bit of, of anxiety around, am I good enough? Am I, am I the same or at the same level as my colleagues who were presenting research and information? And that's, that's that sense of kind of, uh, of questioning and, and that imposter syndrome, I guess, um, uh, that I have always felt a sense of. And I, and I see it in our students, too, in many ways. I mean, when you come to a place like Berkeley, you, you can't help but uh, you know, ask yourself, was, was this really meant for me? Like, mm-hmm. th- was it an accident? Mm-hmm. Um, and I appreciate the, the folks like Ruben who are doing that work to remind students that, no, it's not. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, in many ways, uh, the role even the, the, of the Dean of Students mm-hmm. Office. When we have multiple interactions and conversations with students in different capacities all across campus, mm-hmm. we are here to support and mm-hmm. um, provide guidance, but also remind students that they do belong yeah. here. Yeah. So. I think, I, think, I think very, you know, I come from a family who, I, I, Growing up, they always told us, you know, the, the best kind of people are the ones that make really complicated things very simple. And the worst kind of people are the ones that make really simple things very complicated. So I think guilt impacts you and it triggers fear, it triggers doubt, and it makes you question your worth. Mm-hmm. That's what it comes down to. It's that, it's that simple. And that's why in those conversations, in the center is behind closed doors, one-on-one and saying, what fear is coming up for you, right? And it's fear of failure. Mm-hmm. It's fear of something's going to happen to my family and I'm not going to be there. It's fear of like, it's fear of like, what if, what if I am that imposter, right? What, mm-hmm. what if, what if all of this is a mistake? Doubt of like doubting my ability to learn, doubting my ability to succeed, di- di- doubting my ability to be that next generation that's going to take care of my parents and my future family. And then the worth is just like, am I worthy enough to succeed and to be here, right? And because yeah. of that, those combine and the students underperforming because they're psychologically psyching themselves out, right? It's all about like, I'm gonna fail the midterm and it's week one. Mm -hmm. The midterm is like four or five weeks away. Mm -hmm. Let's focus on just today. Let's focus on like, how much rest are you getting? Are you going to class? Have you introduced yourself to your faculty? Have you formed a study group? So it's us norming that and saying, fear is normal. Mm -hmm. Doubt is normal. And that, and sense worth of sh- is normal. that sense of shame, too, that yeah. we, we're, mm-hmm. we're, we're ultimately trying to avoid, right? Yeah. We're, we're trying to avoid almost standing out too much uh, at, at certain right. times, right? And that shame that invokes that lack of connection with other people, that's, mm-hmm. that's what is scary to yeah. me. Because um, yeah. that's, that, that's what drives me and wonders, you know, 
for our students especially, like, do I, again, do I fit? Mm -hmm. so. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I just, I just finished my master's last week and <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. It was a traumatic experience. <laughs> um, but the, the research that I did there was, um, was specifically with women who identified as teen mom who are women of color and who mm. have gone on to get higher ed degrees, right? And I mean, I think the biggest thing I was taken back by was the amount of shame and guilt that mm -hmm. these women were carrying long after being what society calls successful, right? And so, I mean, I had an attorney, I had a director, I had, I mean, and these women had their kids at 13, at 15 for me, right? And so it, to see how that um, manifested, I think earlier when you were saying, you know, when they get their cap and gown, sometimes that, sometimes that helps to solidify, like, yes, I finally made it. And sometimes it just takes on a different life, mm -hmm. right? And so I heard self-worth, um, and, and, and that's, that's where a lot of people stay. They stay in the space of self-worth, which is really an assessment of other people. Um, it, it's an assessment of people outside of you about yourself, right? Rather than people being confident in themselves and that's in right. their ability, like that's two very different things mm -hmm. for me. And so, um, yeah, I would say that that shame and guilt will continue mm -hmm. to, to yeah. perpetuate long past. And, and how else do y'all see um, guilt expressed from students? Y'all work with students mm -hmm. daily. When students come and talk to you, mm -hmm. what, 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 Fear, spheres of life, does it affect for yeah, them? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's an excellent, I was just gonna yeah. say, that's I an mean, excellent question. From my time in the dean's office, a lot of it was that. It was students who were coming in who lacked a large amount of self-care, like mm -hmm. just had no idea mm -hmm. where to even go, who to talk to, like, or, or even, I would say, even have the words to really articulate what it was that they were going through, right? And so sometimes with the students, you literally have to say, like, are you afraid you're not going to have housing? Are you afraid you're not going to have food? Like, you have to ask very pointed questions because in my experience, that wasn't even there. Like, they weren't still in such survival mode of their life or whatever their experience has been that they didn't even know how to articulate what it is that they needed at that time. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of students who, you know, experienced depression or um, mm -hmm. experienced, you know, suicidal ideations. I mean, yeah. it, it ranges, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I'm not a clinician, so I don't want to like, yeah. but in, in yeah. the students that I've talked to, it can be something as, as easy to fix as financials to something more complex, mm -hmm. like an actual yeah. diagnosed condition where, you know, they have to go see someone because yeah. of the things that they've been through. So it sounds like we're talking about a constellation mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. uh, survivor guilt is perhaps the broadest or catch-all term, mm -hmm. but uh, at a concrete level, we're talking about feelings of shame, of lack of belonging, fear, doubt, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. self-worth, all of which have then an impact on subsequent behavior, mm -hmm. uh, including, as you noted, Liz, self-care, mm -hmm. including not being able uh, to think about one's own well-being and what one needs to do mm -hmm. to get ahead with this special opportunity that one has had. Um, which brings us to the topic of the, the specific resources that are mm -hmm. available at Cal to, uh, to the students whom we serve. Um, Ruben, let me start with you. You yeah. mentioned uh, CE3. Yeah. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that and, and uh, specifically where to find it, what it is, yeah. uh, what it does. Absolutely, yeah, so CE3 is the Centers for Educational Equity and Excellence, and we call it for short CE3. Uh, we're located in the Cesar Chavez Student Center and also in Stiles Hall. Mm -hmm. um, so it's seven different programs that works with non-traditional students. EOP is our largest program. Any student that's a first generation college goer. EOP. EOP, Educational, Educational Opportunity Program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so first generation college goers, uh, folks that are receiving either Pell Grants or Dream Aid, or students that identify as underrepresented ethnic minorities, right? Any, uh, la black, Latino, Southeast Asian, so on and so forth. Um, so that's one. There's over uh, 11,000 EOP qualifying students on our campus. So we want to make sure to share that, that, that to eradicate this notion that, that, there's, that there's hardly any students. Uh, second is a transfer center. Any student that comes from the community college system. Then you go student parents, which uh, we've talked about uh, over this conversation. Veterans, uh, foster youth, undocumented students, and reentry students, which are 25 years and older. We have two really fascinating new projects that are going to evolve into programs, which is any student who has been previously incarcerated. It's called the Undergra Underground Scholars Initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, and then food security, any student that is struggling to, um, to eat 
or to nourish themselves with nutritious food, we're working with them. And you can find us at Cesar Chavez of the Styles Hall Center, and the space is dedicated for the success of those student populations. So these are folks who the staff themselves come from those identities. So they're working with you from a, from a lived experience, from a schooled experience. All of them have their degrees in those specialized areas, but also very much aware of the navigational capital that is needed to succeed at Berkeley and also the personal drive uh, because of that connection of that lived experience that we have. These resources are fantastic. And I was just wondering from a student perspective, what else is being done in terms of administration and faculty so that faculty are more inclusive and aware of the tremendous diversity that we have on this campus? Yeah, so I mean, from the aspect of student affairs, uh, there's many divisions here, and I, I, I hate to even mention it to students in general, but to just tell them that uh, we have, uh, particularly the, our partners in equity and inclusion who are mm -hmm. doing work uh, supporting faculty and students of, of various backgrounds. And so the work that they do is um, important because it's not only addressing uh, on the ground needs, but structural issues and needs around uh, access and making sure students feel included. Um, I know the work that we're doing in the Dean of Students Office is actually working towards a sense of belonging and community for students mm -hmm. and building opportunities for that. Um, and I think creating these communities is important for us to actually have um, partnerships and support systems when we have this kind of conversations around doubt and belonging that students have the ability to look at peers as well as faculty and staff mm -hmm. to support them as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, for us, I think I want to highlight um, some of the work that we do in the Dean of Students Office and that's um, outside the classroom, but specifically uh, the student organizations that are on campus, many of which uh, obviously are advised by the LEAD Center on campus, um, and also the Public Service Center, who is doing some tremendous work around community-engaged scholarship, thinking about not only ourselves and reflecting on who we are, but also how we are important to others, especially the community, mm -hmm. uh, and the work that they do and support mm -hmm. the, the local community, too. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of ways that we can kind of get people connected, um, it creates a sense of self-worth and also um, provides a, a, a greater inspiration of, of uh, supporting others. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I just wanted to add also kind of from the dean's office just to your question around faculty and administration. Yeah. Um, and I'm only talking about the dean's office because I just Could finished working. <laughs> um, but um, they have a lovely student of concern committee, which does deal directly with the students who are experiencing anything difficult. Um, it's an entire committee just dedicated to the well-being of students, and it's based on a referral service. But the other piece of that is educating faculty and administration on how to identify students who may be having a difficult time. So mm -hmm. if there is a student who is particularly withdrawn from the class you know teaching the educating the faculty on what to do about that right mm -hmm. and how to report that and and um, and what resources are available and so mm -hmm. that committee really works to um, uh, deal on a case-by-case -case basis with students who are really struggling but from a multi-lens perspective mm -hmm. so you have financial aid at the table you have the graduate division at the table fine and like I mean it's it's a bunch counselors of different tank center, counselors yeah. from the tank center then there's the tank center right I know that was something mm -hmm. I really took yes. advantage of um, while I was an undergrad here and using their counseling sessions down mm -hmm. there were amazing and then just to echo EOP I mean that was like it still is my hub you know when I'm when I'm having a difficult time to know that there's people there who mm -hmm. have lived through similar experiences is also really helpful mm -hmm. and then um, I'm trying to think of any other resources but and there's a lot of uh, resources within the residence halls too so yeah. many of our students who are living on campus yeah. they are being supported by resident assistant or yeah. resident director or professional staff yeah. and faculty and residents as well yeah. too yeah. Um, so and and they're all in partnership with the the same group and actually able, able to facilitate yeah. uh, any kind of communication with the students of concern committee yeah. which is a multidisciplinary approach like like Liz said yeah. around supporting students mm -hmm. who may have struggles or difficulties yeah. in the classroom and these may be symptoms uh, of students who are having uh, yeah. questions of whether they belong here or maybe struggling or they you never know what the yeah. symptoms may be but they may be yeah. uh, expressing them in the classroom I think, I think to to bring it back to 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 just at the student level yeah the best resource for students is the student themselves okay it's going to be hard for you to connect with resources if you're not sharing that you need mm -hmm. resources right. to begin with and it's very difficult it's very hard to to, to accept first and foremost that you need help, yeah. but trust me that at Berkeley, the most successful students are the ones that ask for help yeah, for many reasons. Ask for help for um, advising, for faculty, for research, for finding a job. Yeah. Just even speaking up and saying, hey, I'm do you know anybody that could help me figure this out? 
and put, people will point you in the right direction. Oftentimes, a lot of students come to Berkeley and they don't maximize their experiences because they never ask for help. And Ruben, in that same vein with, and everyone, with asking for help, I think uh, that kind of opens the door of allyship. So That's what right. about friends of survivors? How can they be supportive mm -hmm. allies? Yeah. Well, I wanna just add briefly yeah. to what he said around, mm -hmm. I know that at least it was my experience that asking for help or getting the help that I needed sometimes felt selfish. <laughs> and that also mm -hmm. has a lot to do with the guilt piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've come to learn now is that I cannot care for other people if I do not know how to care for myself. Right. Um, and that is something that I wish I had learned earlier on mm -hmm. and that I had learned to, to disassociate those two things. Just because I'm taking care of what I need and I'm speaking up for that, does, that doesn't mean I'm weak and that doesn't mean that you know I, I can't do anything for myself. I can do a lot of things for myself and I have done a lot of things for myself, but I've also done it with the help of other people and mm -hmm. so, um, I, I wanted to just note that. But then um, along with the friend thing, I mean, build your tribe, you know, and build mm -hmm. your community from, from the beginning. I know for me, that was my Summer Bridge people. I came in through the summer program, you know, and those are people that I still love and hold dear till this day. And it was also people who I can, um, there was some connection there, right? I think you made a great point earlier about not everybody will identify with your experience, but I guarantee you, at, at least one person will, will latch on to a piece of your experience, mm -hmm. maybe not the whole thing. You know, like I know that I can't come to Ruben and you know, he won't necessarily connect with my teen mom story, right? But he can connect on the maternal mm -hmm. side of it because mm -hmm. I know that he's very close to his mother, right? Mm -hmm. And so I know that there's pieces of that that he will latch mm -hmm. on to, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would say, you know, build your community, talk to people, like mm -hmm. share. I, and um, I, I want to, bring up just a quick point, which is the advice about sharing and about helping yourself juxtaposed against the feeling of shame yeah. and mm -hmm. the feeling mm -hmm. of guilt, yeah. essentially what translates into a hiding of that identity mm -hmm. of those problems. If you're a student who is in that space where you're, you're being told, you know, share and look, look for these resources, but you can't bring yourself to do it, what do you do? Mm -hmm. What's the best way to start? Mm -hmm. that's, an, that's, that's excellent, because that was what I was hope, waiting yeah. to, to mm -hmm. at some point get to. We have to norm this. <laughs> it's normal for you to be feeling what you're yeah. feeling. I felt it. We just shared in this conversation that all of us have felt it. And we've been through the school, we've graduated, we've done the graduate work, and now we're professionals. And we're still wrestling with some of those things at a different level and a different capacity. But first and foremost, know that you're not the only one and know that right. this is normal. So feeling that guilt, feeling that shame, feeling that isolation, so on and so forth, that's why it's, it's first and foremost when we eradicate this like this isolation that's currently going on is the best thing that we can do, norm that. Second is whether you're the person that's feeling that way or an ally to that person, yeah. don't hold yourself accountable to solve what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You are not responsible to solve, you're responsible to care for yourself. Okay. And the best way to care for yourself is to work up the courage to ask for help or for somebody to point you in the right direction, oh, yeah. right? My mom always says like, I don't want you to give me gold, just point me where gold is and I'll go get it myself, right? Yeah, yeah. It's the same thing. It's as norming that it's okay for us to be feeling these ways, whether you're incoming freshman or a graduating senior, as long as you arrive at a place of help. And I wanna just mention one quick thing too about allyship too, is that, uh, and the stories that are not uh, the same. Uh, I can't, I can't identify without, with the idea of ha without having food security in my life. I know that there were certain privilege, uh, privileges I had growing up. Um, and for me and for other allies though that have different stories, it's important that they um, understand and hear those stories. And if you do not relate to them, empathize with them and listen. And that's the biggest thing too, because there's often times where I think allies um, go to a place of pity. Um, and that's not what people are looking for. They're looking for their stories to be known and heard mm -hmm. and to look for ways in which we connect. And that's the opposite again of shame, right? So I just wanted to, to put that out too. 
Thank you. Thank you. And so the importance of allies without uh, without patronizing, without feeling pity is, is huge, particularly when you need those social connections. I want to reemphasize uh, CE3 mm -hmm. as an important resource, the Office of the Dean of Students. We often think of the Office of the Dean of Students as a place where you go it's when scary. things go bad. <laughs> uh, but it seems like there's, there's, a, there's a very important function to help prevent and to help students uh, push through. Mm -hmm. When I would also add, like, there's folks like us everywhere mm -hmm. on campus, sure. you know, and so, you know, you never are going to know who's going to listen to what you're saying unless you actually say it. Um, and so, you know, speak up. Mm -hmm. is, that's really important. So it's important to speak up, important to, important to recognize that uh, the feelings associated with survivor guilt are more prevalent than we think, in part because these are such uh, private thoughts, and most importantly that there are resources of campus because we celebrate and we want to value and we want to promote that diversity that's in California and in our world. I want to thank each of you for being here today. Uh, this has been an incredibly informative segment. And um, David Surratt, Ruben Canedo Sanchez, Liz Rodriguez, uh, our guests today. And you will find them on campus and very reachable in our university. With that, Dri Cavusi and I would like to say thank you for watching. And we'll see you in the next show.